Uh, and I'd like to present again our Renaissance surgeon who is not only a specialist in adult congenital and uh, thoracic transplantation, but also uh, one of his favorite things to do is operate on the aorta. Dr. McGilvery. Uh, I'd say coming from uh, Boston to Houston to do aortic surgery is like bringing sand to the beach. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of aortic surgery done down here. Not only a lot of it done, but a lot of it done very, very well. So with that, um, uh, aortic aneurysms, uh, uh, we uh, know uh, from natural history studies that they tend to grow uh, at different rates. Certainly the ascending aorta grows at about point, a little more than 0.1 centimeter a year. A descending aorta and thoracoabdominal aorta grows a little bit faster than that. I mean, imaging has been uh, incredibly, uh, an incredible change in the course of my uh, medical career. Not only can you diagnose aneurysms, but you can really closely follow them serially to monitor their growth and help you uh, plan electively when to intervene. Um, there are some inflection points that uh, 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 generally speaking, uh, the risk uh, of uh, rupture or dissection tends to go along with the uh, size. Uh, it's unusual when you get below the uh, size of five centimeters, but that risk goes up a little bit. Uh, and certainly once you get above six centimeters uh, in the ascending, it goes up significantly. Uh, that being said, you know, size is really a pretty gross tool to decide the risk of rupture or dissection. Uh, there probably, there's more work being done now on 4D uh, imaging uh, to, to help us understand when we should intervene uh, in some patients. Patients, as you know, rupture at smaller uh, sizes, uh, and some patients can have pretty big aneurysms that didn't rupture, obviously, in the meantime. But generally speaking, the bigger the aneurysm gets, uh, the more risk there is of trouble, of uh, dissection, rupture, and death. So once you get above six centimeters, uh, the yearly uh, rate of uh, rupture um, uh, is about 16 percent. It's a little bit skewed because we obviously don't let people get bigger aneurysms. Our natural history studies are, are a little bit uh, are a little bit skewed. The guidelines would say that uh, in the absence of a connective tissue disease, you should intervene when the aorta is 5.5 centimeters or greater. Uh, depending upon the connective tissue disease the patient has. And as we learn more and more, most of these patients that develop aneurysm probably do have some kind of unnamed connective tissue disease. But for those named diseases, certainly for Ehlers-Danlos or for uh, Lois Dietz, we recommend replacing the ascending aorta a smaller size than 5.5 centimeters. Aortic dissection, the most common catastrophe uh, of the human aorta has an incidence of about three four hundred thousand per year. It's a life-threatening condition, and the mortality goes up with uh, uh, every hour. Uh, so survival of the patient is very dependent upon a prompt diagnosis and prompt therapy. Uh, it can be, even though these patients have classic signs often, they sometimes don't, and a delay in diagnosis uh, is associated with an increase in uh, mortality. There are several different classification systems. Uh, here in Houston, we still use the DeBakey classification. Type 1, uh, ascending aorta, arch, and descending aorta. Type 2, just the ascending aorta, not the descending aorta. Uh, type 3, just the descending aorta. The uh, Stanford classification uh, is pretty simple. If it involves the ascending aorta, it's a type A. If it doesn't involve the ascending aorta, it's a type B. Uh, the breakdown is about two-thirds, roughly, of dissections are type A dissections, and a little more than a third are type B dissections. Uh, uh, the, the classic presentation is terrible, tearing, ripping, awful chest pain. Uh, you talk to the patients and you almost think they're histrionic, uh, that they're, that, but the, and you look at them, they look like they're generally in terrible pain. And it's different from ischemic heart pain. Patients talk about, oh, it's a pressure, it's a tightness. Um, it, it's, it's very different. But about 15% of patients don't have any pain, and they can present with uh, a number of other different uh, findings. Uh, CT or TEE are the two uh, most common ways that these uh, dissections are uh, diagnosed. They have a very high sensitivity and specificity rate. Um, 
the initial management, the ABCs, uh, get uh, invasive hemodynamic monitoring in them as soon as you can, and start anti-impulse therapy. That's anti-impulse therapy, not anti-hypertensive therapy. Uh, the rookie move is to start them on vasodilators, uh, nitrates, uh, and, and that can increase the shear forces in their aorta and increase rather than decrease the risk of extension or uh, rupture. So beta blockers, calcium channel blockers. You do want to be aware that in patients who have aortic regurgitation, and that's a significant number of patients with type A dissections, that giving beta block A can slow, beta block A can slow the heart rate down and make that uh, aortic regurgitation more significant. Um, the treatment for acute type A dissections is surgery. It's surgery as soon as possible. As I used to tell my residents, you want to think of a type A dissection as holding a hand grenade in your hand with the pin pulled out. You don't have a lot of time. Uh, and a patient that can look very stable can become uh, dead very quickly. Uh, type B dissections um, are treated with some kind of intervention, uh, uh, at least for right now. Uh, uh, uncomplicated type B dissections, and we'll get into what that means a little bit, uh, best medical management. This is from the IRED database, looking at uh, the mortality rate for type A dissections. Uh, it goes high, very fast, very early. Uh, so again, the treatment for that is surgery. The goal of treatment, uh, generally speaking, for acute type A dissections is to keep the patient from dying. Uh, it's not to resect the uh, entire dissection. Uh, it's not to uh, uh, reestablish flow to, uh, uh, well, it's not to resect the entire dissection. Most of the problems that will cause death of the patient can be managed by replacing the ascending uh, aorta. That includes uh, the most commonplace patients will rupture, uh, is in the ascending aorta, causing either exsanguination or tamponade. Uh, aortic insufficiency is a very common cause of death uh, in these patients, and that can be corrected by replacing the ascending aorta. And by reestablishing flow in the true lumen, you can uh, treat a lot of the malperfusion uh, syndromes. Um, even in patients that are promptly operated on, if you look at the IRED database, still the operative mortality rate is about 20%. Uh, part of that has to do with most dissections are taken care of at places that don't see a lot of them. If you Look at results from uh, busier centers, the rates are somewhere in the high single uh, uh, digits, but, uh, but by the IRA database, it's, a, it's about 20%. Um, uh, approach to uh, type A dissections uh, through a sternotomy require cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, the degree of hypothermia, uh, we're moving uh, away from profound hypothermia and even deep hypothermia to more moderate hypothermia. There's been some data to show that the outcomes may be, uh, may be a little bit better. Uh, have gone from total circulatory arrest to some degree of cerebral perfusion, whether it be anti-grade or retrograde cerebral perfusion. Uh, and doing that allows you to do an open distal anastomosis, uh, which uh, allows for a uh, more precise and uh, better anastomosis. Uh, Another thing that has sort of been, has been a trend is moving away from the femoral artery for the preferred site of cannulation to something more proximal, either the uh, axillary or sub, uh, you know, axillary subclavian artery or uh, in the anominate artery. That uh, allows you a peripheral site, but at the same time uh, can give you uh, access to integrates cerebral perfusion if that's your preferred method. Uh, retrograde cerebral perfusion, which was originally uh, described for uh, massive ear embolism has been used uh, at uh, uh, some uh, centers with very good success uh, at increasing the amount of uh, 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 circulatory rest time for uh, brain protection. And that uh, technically is a, your blood is uh, uh, flown up through the superior vena cava uh, to, uh, into the brain. Uh, integrate cerebral perfusion. Um, uh, this originally described was to directly cannulate all three of the arch vessels and have blood flow grow integrate up the arteries. Um, many of us, including me, um, generally we go and cannulate uh, through a sidearm graft on the axillary artery. That gives you an uncluttered uh, field, making uh, either doing an uh, extended hemi-arch or a total arch replacement uh, uh, easier. Uh, 
what to do with the arch, uh, as I said, I mean, there's, there's a lot of people now reporting saying that you should do something to the arch at the, uh, at the time of the original dissection. And I think that depends on a lot of things. Uh, um, certainly, uh, I think you should have a stable patient that's uh, hemodynamically stable and doesn't have some kind of malperfusion. Um, uh, an experienced uh, team. Uh, if the aneurysm, if the arch is aneurysm, has an aneurysm in it or a complex tear, that would be a, a, a good time to deal with that because we know that those patients have an early uh, incidence of uh, degeneration and certainly patients with uh, connective tissue disease. Uh, whether it be Marfan's or Lois D syndrome. Another uh, uh, marker for uh, early aneurysmal degeneration of the arch is a large tear on the subclavian artery. So uh, if you have um, uh, the uh, ability to replace the arch uh, and stabilize that, uh, uh, that would also be an indication to do an arch replacement. And that can either be done with a conventional uh, arch replacement or by doing a frozen elephant trunk. A uh, frozen elephant trunk is deploying uh, a uh, stent graft through the, open, uh, through the opened uh, aortic arch uh, and under direct vision uh, deploying that uh, and then either uh, leaving, uh, in this case, the arch or um, most of us would replace the arch and sew it right to the, uh, to the T-bar. Uh, as for proximally, um, depending upon, I mean, most of the time you can do a supracoronary tube graft. Uh, if there is disease of the aortic valve or a very complicated uh, dissection in the aortic root, you can do a composite root replacement. More and more, uh, certainly in younger patients, uh, good success with uh, valve sparing uh, root technique, uh, preserving the patient's own uh, aortic valve and reimplanting uh, the coronaries. The mechanism of AI, even severe AI, uh, uh, there are several, and many of them can be, uh, uh, can be stabilized uh, with uh, doing aortic surgery uh, and leaving the native valve behind. Uh, dilation of the uh, sinotubular junction can cause uh, incomplete co-optation of the cusps. Uh, the dissection can tear off a commissure that renders the valve uh, incompetent, uh, or you can even have prolapse of the septum across the aortic valve uh, causing aortic regurgitation. So at the time of surgery, inspect it, and, and, and even with severe aortic regurgitation, in the absence of native valve uh, disease, you can um, usually spare the aortic valve. The uh, root, uh, even if the, ex if the dissection extends into the root, oftentimes you don't need to replace that root. Uh, the, the group at Penn has shown, and many of us use, this neomedial technique by putting felt inside the dissected portion of the root and the long-term outcomes of that for freedom of reoperation is actually quite good. Uh, uh, whether for aneurysmal disease or for uh, dissection, uh, valve sparing aortic root replacement uh, is, a, is a really ele elegant operation to take out uh, 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 aneurysms or dissections. This uh, shows the mobilization of the aortic root the aortic valve in the center, the coronaries have been uh, mobilized off as buttons uh, and get below the level of the aortic annulus into the left ventricular outflow tract. And then an appropriate size graft can be telescoped over that to stabilize the ventricular aortic junction and the uh, aortic valve can be reimplanted uh, into, uh, uh, into that graft and the coronary artery is reimplanted. This is data from Emory. Uh, uh, in acute dissections, uh, where they have a big experience with valve sparing roots, um, have an excellent survival, and their freedom from uh, aortic valve replacement is uh, uh, hard to beat. Uh, and uh, uh, over time, their reintervention rate is uh, quite low. Type B dissections, um, I'd say our thinking on that has changed, uh, at least my thinking on that has changed uh, over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, unlike type A dissections, where surgery is the most important uh, therapy, uh, we learned early on that operating on type B dissections has a higher mortality than treating them medically. Uh, and so uh, certainly open surgery or intervention uh, is reserved for the uh, complications of a type B dissection and that best medical management continues to be uh, the best treatment. What do I mean by complicated or uncomplicated? 
So about uh, three quarters of type B dissections are considered uncomplicated, meaning they have stable hemodynamics. They don't have any uh, clinical uh, malperfusion and their pain can be well controlled with antihypertensive therapy. Uh, complicated dissections, those are uh, dissections that are leaking or about to rupture or have ruptured, uh, have clinical malperfusion syndromes or have rapid aneurysmal uh, expansion, uh, refractory hypertension on three, four, or five drugs, uh, or despite uh, uh, aggressive medical therapy, have persistent or uncontrolled uh, pain. Um, uh, TVAR has been a bit of a game changer for, in many ways. Uh, certainly for complicated dissection. The benefit uh, is uh, that it will close the uh, entry tear and redirect flow through the true lumen, just like we do with uh, uh, an ascending uh, uh, dissection. And it uh, can and does remodel the aorta, not only the ratio between the false and the true lumen, but actually the, the uh, total size and, uh, uh, and decrease the need for further interventions. The risk of a TVAR uh, uh, certainly early on in acute dissection, there is a risk of turning that type uh, A dissection into a, excuse me, a type B dissection into type A dissection. There is a risk of stroke uh, and paralysis. And certainly patients that have uh, dissections extending into their abdominal component, you can, can, you can create new entry tears and, uh, and accelerate the rate of uh, aneurysmal degeneration uh, in the abdomen. The INSTEAD trial was uh, done uh, and reported uh, almost 10 years ago where they compared TVAR versus optimal medical therapy. And uh, at uh, two years, what they showed that there was really no significant difference between medical therapy and TVAR, which kind of uh, threw a wet blanket on the use of uh, TVAR, uh, uh, not only with uh, aortic death, but overall death and progression of disease. Uh, they followed those patients out longer, the INSTEAD XL trial, and it's actually pretty interesting. That after two years, again, uh, uh, with many things that we see in medicine, that the rate of death and aneurysmal degeneration did indeed accelerate, and those patients that had TVAR placed did much better in the, in the long term, at least, uh, 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 in, in, and they're still collecting that data. Very important to follow these patients uh, with any kind of uh, aortic uh, pathology after the repaired uh, dissections are certainly the gift that keeps on giving. So you want to have a regular scheduled uh, follow-up uh, with imaging. Uh, so anyway, uh, thanks for your attention. We've uh, learned a lot and continue to do a lot uh, in uh, aortic disease. Uh, and um, uh, it is a, uh, as Dr. Scheinbein pointed out, uh, it is a team sport and you can take uh, patients with terrible problems and get them better. Thanks very much.